I must warn members that in this house there will be no smoking, no taking of snuff, no discharging of firearms, ringing of cell phones, or any other disorderly conduct. The resolution before the House today is, be it resolved that freedom of speech includes the freedom to hate. Ladies and gentlemen, Section 319 sub 2 of the Canadian Criminal Code makes it a criminal offense to willfully promote hatred against any identifiable group by communicating statements other than in private conversation. And an individual who violates this law and promotes hatred against an identifiable group can be put in prison for up to two years. Ladies and gentlemen, the value of speech and the reason why it is recognized as a fundamental right in all liberal democracies is that when you're able to speak freely and speak your mind, you are able to actually self-actualize yourself and fulfill yourself. You're able to announce to the world who you are and what you believe in. If you restrict people from speaking these things and leave them mainly to the world of thoughts and beliefs, you deny their existence as a social person, someone who can really only find their realization and let the world know who they are if they can speak about the things that they hold nearest and dearest to them. It is an unfortunate reality that there are people who think that a core part of their personality and that something that is important to them manifests itself in hatred towards other groups and beliefs about those groups. And that is something that we must protect if we believe individuals should be allowed to actually be individuals in society. And if we look to the heuristic device of the social contract, I would put to you that no individual would agree to relinquish the right to be an individual merely for the security that the state offers them. Indeed, condemning people's ability to speak tells them that they cannot announce to the world who they are and be the person that they see themselves to be. And this is not something we can ever take away from someone simply because we don't like the kinds of things they're talking about. Rory. But when somebody's idea of self-actualization goes beyond speech to actual violence, we restrict that. So speech that has a probable consequence of violence, why is that allowed? Well, I think the big difference is because violence is something that actually concretely and directly interferes in another individual's ability to actually be themselves and to self-actualize in society. So that is why we criminalize those things. And any individual who, because they hear hated speech, results in attacking another, that person should certainly be put in jail and should have their rights curtailed. But to bar it from the outset, to say that just in case something will happen, we refuse to allow you to be an individual is not permissible in a properly working liberal democracy. Democracy. Now, the second argument I'd like to look at is the problem of self-censorship that arises in these cases. Now, I would put to you, ladies and gentlemen, that most of us probably are not sure what exactly constitutes hate speech. What are its limits? What do you actually have to do to come within the ambit of this provision? And the provision is, as I read to you at the beginning of this speech, it necessarily needs to be broad if it's to have any purchase in society at all. We cannot simply stipulate which things are hatred and which are not. But the necessary result of this is that there will be many individuals who are concerned that something they have to say might fall within the purview of this statute, might actually be hate speech, and thus will elect not to say these things because, shockingly enough, they do not want to be a criminal and they do not want to risk going to jail for two years, even if it's actually the case that this is likely to happen because they're worried about it happening. Now, what is the result of this? This means individuals actually self-censor the things they're going to say in ways that are detrimental, not simply to them, but to society at large. Because it might be the case that there are individuals who have strong opinions on immigration issues, on foreign policy issues, on issues of religion and society, on issues of Canadian involvement around the world, on issues of terrorism, that they worry about bringing into a political discourse because they fear that those comments might be taken as hate speech because they state that a certain race shouldn't be allowed to immigrate, that we shouldn't be concerned about certain people in the world. And these are comments that, whether you agree with them or not, need to exist within the dem democratic discussion that this society is based on. Now, thirdly and finally, I would like to point out that it is, in fact, detrimental and injurious to the actual aims of this legislation to bar the public discourse of hatred. 
Now, I assume that in drafting this provision, the individuals who support it would like it to be effective, that they in fact would like to see hate speech disappear from public spaces. What does this mean? This means that when someone makes a comment that is hateful towards a race, ethnicity, or any group within our society, then it is impossible for that society to call it out, to interrogate it, and to point out its historical inaccuracies, its factual inaccuracies, its irrationality, or the fact that it actually makes people feel uncomfortable. And when you lose the ability to interrogate these things, you actually lose the ability to get at the root causes and feelings and issues that actually cause such hate speech to exist. So while Christina and I say all people should be free to speak, we do believe they should be free to speak. It doesn't mean that we always approve of the things they're saying in content. But if we want to have an equal society, we need to be able to address those questions and show them to be wrong. Merely creating the taboo of criminality and trying to erase them entirely does nothing. It allows the private discourse that exists in homes and schoolyards to be the only area where these issues are broached and thus is not an effective way to help people we proudly propose. Today I'm going to be talking about two constructive points. The first is going to have to do with the individual harms that are coming out of the, the presence of hate speech in Canadian society. And the second has to do with our conflicting model about what freedom of speech means and the value that it has in that same society. Then of course I'm going to be telling you why everything that's been said on side government today in that one speech, they've already messed it up. It's already wrong. So what are we talking about today on side opposition? We posit to you in the audience and you Mr. Speaker that the world we're living in today, although it might sound trite, is, is a more globalized world one than we've been living in, in the past. We do have that global village, and as I roll my eye because it's a bit of a cliche, we all have to recognize that it's true. We're interacting with different people from different ethnicities on a greater scope than ever before, and we think that demands a certain amount of sensitivity around these especially inflammatory and volatile um, things such as hate speech. So for that reason, we think that there, there is an egregious harm that can be done because we have people interacting in a way that they've never done before. So let's look at the independent harm that happens when you have people having hate speech as part of the discourse. We think, just like Ren does, that self-actualization is an important thing. But we think that self-actualization, which for those of you who aren't in on the jargon, is just basically positing yourself as a person in the social realm, is very, very much something that's damaged when you're being hated at all the time. We think that's an intuitive and understandable thing, but we need to understand the exact harms that come from being part of a minority group that is being segregated and, and systematically having hatred flung at you. We think that it, it ruins your ability to function as an equal part of society, even if there are legal protections for you as a legal part of society, because there's no cultural weight behind that, or you feel that you are alienated. We think that that is a huge damage to self-actualization. It means you can't participate fully, because there's always a constant and often vehement, potentially racist voice telling you that you are not welcome there. For, so for that reason, we think that this is a very strong harm that we need to prevent, especially what I've told you in light of the fact that we have more people interacting from from different disparate experiences. The more interesting point, I think, was the idea of self-censorship. And the idea here, as brought to you by side government, was that this is a very ambiguous thing, they, this proposition, as outlined in the criminal code. Like, we don't really know how to interpret it. And therefore, people have to force their own consideration on the matter. And we don't really see a marked difference between this forced consideration on the, person, on the person's behalf of themselves and potentially bringing that debate out into the public sphere. We think if this person has the conviction which which would lead to any sort of constructive democratic analysis or any dis uh, constructive discourse, they're going to say it anyway. What this will weed out potentially, we will admit, are people who are sort of ambivalent about their views and are considering saying something that they don't necessarily believe in. We think that's a good thing. We want to combat people who are on the fence on issues such as hatred and racism because that will sort of stem the tide of a sort of group mentality which leads to bad things like genocide or more in a Canadian context, the idea of... Uh, defaming graves, etc. We think that group mentality and that ambiguity of thought is something we want to compete. So because I've told you today about how we have to recognize our own multiculturalism and more importantly we have to recognize the independent harms that are associated with this and for everything else I've said, we beg to oppose. <laughs> We on this side of the house today believe that even if you believe that hatred is something that you shouldn't have in society and that is greatly de uh, detrimental to society, we don't believe it is something that you should necessarily be putting people in jail for. We believe the mere act of just getting up and saying that I hate group X, I believe that group X shouldn't be here, not inciting people to, uh, not inciting people to necessarily get rid of them, not telling people that you know who will commit a crime, for example, it, sorry, as Ren was talking about, 
about when you go on a radio show, not right now, thank you, when you go on a radio show and you get up and you say that you hate a certain group, that's considered hate speech in our setting. We're not talking about the person at the Klan's meeting knowing that the group of young kids are very riled up, want to beat somebody up, telling them to go do that or just spewing hate. That's not what's covered under the hate speech. Under hate speech, it's just if you get up and say that you hate and you say that other people should. We believe on this side of the house that that's not something you should be going to jail for. Whether or not other people down the road choose to six months from now act on what you heard, whether or not your opinions have had sway on them, that isn't necessarily your problem, but a problem with that person and perhaps a problem with society at large. Anyone should be able to, uh, to say their opinions without having it uh, censored at any point, but I'll take your point. Are you seriously suggesting that Jerry Falwell going on the radio and saying that God hates fags is not connected to gay bashing? What I'm going to say is that Gary Falwell going on the radio and saying that God hates fags, if he does get up and say that and other people listen to that and they choose to go out, that does not, uh, if, it was, if he said it to a group where he knows people are going to go out and gay bash, then that isn't covered under the crime. We're talk if he does say it and people choose to take that into their account, they probably already held that feelings before. The feeling of hatred would exist whether or not we stifled Gary Falwell. All that happens is when we have him on the radio show, you can also have questions coming in saying, why do you believe that because until you choose to engage with it until you stop locking up people just for spewing the hate and rather deal with why they have in the hate in the first place until you believe that we don't believe that anything can actually come about so we on this side of the house have talked to you about the value of freedom of speech we've talked to you about how what it leads to right now is it leads to self-censorship the, these laws and leads to many detrimental effects and we've talked to you furthermore about how we don't believe if anything that this should be a criminal act that you should not be severely limiting one person's freedom in uh, for a spewing their own opinions. And for these reasons, we beg to propose. Rights are a convenient fiction that we as a group, that we as a society buy into in order to make everyday life bearable. I don't have a right to life because God came down and spake, lo, Rory shall have a right to life. If you believe that, that's okay. You have a right to do that. I have a right to life because it would be awfully inconvenient if I started denying the rights of everybody else to life. And so society comes to a consensus and we create the fiction of a right to life. The same thing is true of every single right. Every, a right to property exists because when people hold property and can profit from it, they develop it to the benefit of the commons. And the same thing is true of speech. So I want to talk to you today about why the free speech, the discourse that was discussed on the side of government benches, is absolutely and totally irrelevant to this round because of one very simple four-letter word, and that is hate. How does hate add to discourse? I asked, does Jerry Falwell standing up and saying God hates fags actually add to discourse? Because you can't go to Mr. Fal Reverend Falwell and say, please, justify that rationally, he'll go back to the Bible. Hate is the little ejector button of rationality from a conversation. It's when you pull back the onion far enough and find at its core that someone simply cannot justify their beliefs and there's a little kernel of hatred right at the center. Because otherwise, it's a rational argument. Otherwise, it's discourse. But you, you disagree. Well, no, exactly. That's the point. So when Jerry Falwell says this, you have large numbers of people in the world pointing out how irrational and stupid it is, thus teaching others the fallacies of hate, instead of just restricting it to private households where there was no such discussion. Right. So when people stand up and spew hateful discourse, people are automatically going to recognize that this isn't true. But lots of people subscribe to Ernst Zundel's pamphlets denying the Holocaust, even though Ernst Zundel tried to claim that UFOs were Nazi technology that had spirited away the leadership of the Third Reich to Antarctica. Nobody who was buying these pamphlets, who was paying for these publications, seemed to notice this. Because everything we've heard from Ren and from Christina is generous and kind and good, but it presumes that we're dealing with rational actors. I want to deal with Christina's constructive point, because she said, making this criminal is what's wrong. Making speaking your opinions criminal is a terrible thing. But I'd ask you, if I hate a group enough to go on the radio and talk about how I hate them, is it reasonable for me to assume that someone's views might be more extreme and that someone might go out and hurt people? I think it's reasonable. And we do prosecute people 
for reasonably foreseeable consequences of their actions. But let's take a look at this in context, because what we haven't heard very much is how often Section 319 sub 2 is actually used and against whom it is used. Because you're right, this isn't going to prosecute Uncle Randy who has a few too many beers at dinner and starts rambling into a tirade against immigrants. This is used against academics who use their position of power to enforce their opinions on their students. This is used against people who are determined enough in their opinions that they do start radio talk shows preaching hatred. And then the question becomes, whom are we trying to protect with this? Because you can stand up and say any offensive thing you want in a room like this, and any group that is targeted by what you say probably has the grapes to look you in the eye and say, get lost, that makes no sense. But you can't offer that kind of justification for the black kid in the playground who's picked on. You can't offer that kind of justification to the gay kid in high school who's bashed because this environment is allowed to exist. So let's go back to what my colleague told you. She told you that we limit rights when we see negative consequences. We limit people's freedoms when we see that exercising those freedoms can have negative uh, ramifications. And we didn't really hear this, anything about this from Christina except to say, if you're just saying the hate, you're not doing the hate. But as I've shown you, you can expect that if you're out there preaching and promoting and promulgating hatred, that someone's actually going to listen to you. There clearly is a market for this. But what have we heard from the government today? We heard a very simplistic analysis that tells you that your rights end where your neighbor's nose begins, which is how we explain it to grade five students. But we're not grade five students. And I think we can have a slightly more sophisticated debate about where somebody's nose begins. Is it simply a question of doing physical harm, or is it a question of creating a poisoned environment? Actually, Rory, your sophisticated analysis was there are no rights, full stop. But I'd like to let you know if there are no rights at all, then is it at all inappropriate to bar all speech? What exactly are the rules that you think govern the idea of when we get to limit rights if they do not exist? As I said, as a society, we've developed a consensus that we all have certain rights and freedoms because they're useful. We accept freedom of speech because we think that truth is important. We think that in government, certainly, transparency is important, and neither is possible without freedom of speech. But I've shown you, Ren, that all this discourse that you want to promote, all this rational debate between the forces of truth and justice and these hatred, hate mongers actually can't happen because there is no debate. People who get up and, and spew racial hatred, who spew hatred against women, who spew homophobia, aren't actually going to rationalize it to you. They aren't going to present studies that back up what they think. They're just going to say, I hate. And with those two words, the debate has ended. Your chance of persuading them is gone. So what I would say is that if you have enough people on the radio saying, I hate, you create a climate of fear. I walked into this room past a young couple, obviously very much in lust, trading spit in the hallway, but a man and a woman. Honestly, if Jerry Falwell weren't on the radio saying God hates fags, how many more gay men would feel comfortable showing affection in public? As soon as a minority group feels it has to change its behavior because of fear of the disapproval of the majority, that's their freedom to self-actualize being infringed upon. And if that's accompanied by actual fear, I think that's a far more egregious violation of rights than telling someone they can't stand up and say, I hate. We were told that this carried a risk of self-censorship, that people might not be sure if what they were going to say constitutes hate speech. I think that's fine. I think it's okay to make rational people who want to have a debate stop and think, do I have something to back up my possibly inflammatory opinion? So we certainly have a lot fewer bar fights if people started doing this. I don't think it's wrong to impose a responsibility on individuals to consider how they think and what they're saying. Just as importantly, it's not as if we haven't heard it before. It's not as if these are new and challenging ideas that could refine our idea of what makes civil society. They're tired, old ideas that have had their time, that have been tried and been rejected by a civil society. And if the sad, pathetic people who want to continue spewing hatred get locked up, I have very little time for those who would oppose this.
Because sooner or later, they are going to come across impressionable minds. And that's the context that Adrian and I have talked about. Because if enough people say it's okay to hate, then people start to believe that it's okay to hurt. And I think that that's a pretty reasonable assumption. I think it's reasonable to assume that people promoting hatred can foresee the consequences of their actions in concrete, harmful action. And since we do criminalize actions that can predictably result in harm, this is an appropriate response to it. Yes, it's a difficult situation. Yes, freedom of speech has acquired some sort of totemic value in Western society. But if freedom of speech results in bloody noses, literal bloody noses, or worse, then it is acceptable to limit it, just as we would limit someone throwing a punch. And we stand proudly against decriminalizing hate speech. Fire, 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 fire. Now you've heard it. Not shouted in a crowded theater, admittedly. As I realize, I seem now to have shouted it in the Hogwarts dining room. <laughs> but the, the point is made. Everyone knows the fatuous verdict of uh, the greatly overpraised Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who asked for an actual example of when it would be proper to limit speech or define it as an action, gave that of shouting fire in a crowded theater. It's very often forgotten what he was doing in that case was sending to prison a group of Yiddish-speaking socialists whose literature was printed in a language most Americans couldn't read, opposing President Wilson's participation in the First World War and the dragging of the United States into this sanguinary conflict which the Yiddish-speaking socialists had fled from Russia to escape. In fact, it could be just as plausibly argued that the Yiddish-speaking socialists who were jailed by the excellent and overpraised Judge Oliver Wendell Holmes were the real firefighters, were the ones who were shouting fire when there really was fire in a very crowded theater indeed. And who is to decide? Well, keep that question if you would, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I hope I may say comrades and friends, before your minds. I exempt myself from the speaker's kind offer of protection that was uh, so generously proffered at the opening of this evening. Anyone who wants to say anything abusive about or to me is quite free to do so, and welcome, in fact, at their own risk. <laughs> and, um, but before they do that, they must have taken, as I'm sure we all should, a short refresher course in the classic texts on this matter, which are John Milton's Areopagitica, Areopagitica being the great hill of Athens for discussion and free expression, um, Thomas Paine's introduction to the Age of Reason, and I would say a John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, in which it is variously said, I'll, I'll, I'll be very daring and summarize all three of these great gentlemen of the great tradition of especially English liberty, um, in one go. What they say is, it's not just the right of the person who speaks to be heard. It is the right of everyone in the audience to listen and to hear. And every time you silence somebody, you make yourself a prisoner of your own action because you deny yourself the right to hear something. In other words, your own right to hear and be exposed is as much involved in all these cases as is the right of the other to voice his or her view. Indeed, as John Stuart Mill said, if all in society were agreed on the truth and beauty and value of one proposition, all except one person, it would be most important, in fact, it would become even more important that that one heretic be heard because we would still benefit from his perhaps outrageous or appalling view. In more modern times, this has been put, I think, best by a personal heroine of mine, Rosa Luxemburg, who said that the freedom of speech is meaningless unless it means the freedom of the person who thinks differently. Um, my great friend John O'Sullivan, former editor of the National Review, and my, I think probably my most conservative and reactionary Catholic friend, once said, uh, it's a t tiny thought experiment, he says, if you hear the Pope saying he believes in God, you think, well, the Pope's doing his job again today. If you hear the Pope saying he's really begun to doubt the existence of God, you begin to think he might be onto something. Well, if everybody in North America is forced to attend at school, uh, 
training in sensitivity or in Holocaust awareness and is taught to study the final solution about which nothing was actually done by this country or North America or the United Kingdom while it was going on. But as, let's say as if in compensation for that, everyone's made to swallow an official and unalterable story of it now. And it's taught as the great moral exemplar, the moral equivalent of the morally lacking elements of the Second World War, the way of stilling our uneasy conscience about that combat. If that's the case with everybody, as it more or less is, and one person gets up and says, you know about this Holocaust, I'm not sure it even happened. In fact, I'm pretty certain it didn't. Indeed, I begin to wonder if the only thing is that the Jews brought a little bit of violence on themselves. That person doesn't just have a right to speak. That person's right to speak must be given extra protection because what he has to say must have taken him some effort to come up with, might be, might contain a grain of historical truth, um, might in any case give people to think about why do they know what they already think they know? How do I know that I know this except that I've always been taught this and never heard anything else? It's always worth establishing first principles. It's always worth saying, what would you do if you met a Flat Earth Society member? Come to think of it, how can I prove the Earth is round? Am I sure about the theory of evolution? I know it's supposed to be true. Here's someone who says there's no such thing. It's all intelligent design. How sure am I of, of my own views? Don't take refuge in the false security of consensus and the feeling that whatever you think, you're bound to be okay because you're in the safely moral majority. One of the proudest moments of my life, that's to say, in the recent past has been defending the British historian David Irving, who is now in prison in Austria for nothing more than the potential of uttering an unwelcome thought on Austrian soil. He didn't actually say anything in Austria. He wasn't even accused of saying anything. He was accused of perhaps planning to say something that violated an Austrian law that says only one version of the history of the Second World War may be taught in our brave little Tyrolean Republic. The Republic that gave us Kurt Waldheim as Secretary General of the United Nations, a man wanted in several countries for war crimes. You know, the country that gave, that has Jörg Haider, the leader of its own fascist party, in the cabinet that sent David Irving to jail. You know the uh, two things that have uh, made Austria famous, given it its reputation, by any chance? Just while I've got you. I hope there are some Austrians here to be upset by it. <laughs> well, it, it pity if not, but the two great achievements of Austria are to have convinced the world that Hitler was German and Beethoven was Viennese. <laughs> now to this proud record they can add, they have the courage finally to face their past and lock up a British historian who's committed no crime except that of thought and writing. And that's a scandal. And I can't find a seconder usually when I propose this, but I don't care. I don't need a seconder. My own opinion is enough for me, and I claim the right to have it defended against any consensus, any majority, anywhere, any place, any time. And anyone who disagrees with this can pick a number, get online, and kiss my ass. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you don't feel you're grown up enough to decide this for yourselves and think you need to be protected from David Irving's edition of the Goebbels Diaries, for example, out of which I learned more about the Third Reich than I had from studying Hugh Trevor Roper and A.J.B. Taylor combined when I was at Oxford. But for those of you who do, I'd recommend another uh, short course of revision. Um, go again and see not just the film and the play, but read the text of uh, Robert Bolt's wonderful play, Man for All Seasons. Some of you must have seen it. Um, where Sir Thomas More decides that he would rather die uh, than lie or betray his faith. And at one moment, More is arguing with a particularly vicious witch-hunting prosecutor, a servant of the king and a hungry and ambitious man. And More says to this man, um, You'd, uh, you'd break the law to punish the devil, wouldn't you? And the prosecutor, the witch hunter, says, break it. He said, I'd cut down, I'd cut down every law in England if I could do that, if I could capture him. And Moore says, yes, you would, wouldn't you? And then when you'd corner the devil and the devil turned around to meet you, where would you run for protection? 
or the laws of England having been cut down and flattened, who would protect you then? Bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that every time you violate or propose to violate the free speech of someone else, you in potentia, you're making a rod for your own back because the other question raised by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes is simply this, who's going to decide? To whom do you award the right to decide which speech is harmful or who is the harmful speaker? Or to determine in advance what are the harmful consequences going to be that we know enough about in advance to prevent? To whom would you give this job? To whom are you going to award the task of being the censor? Isn't it a famous old story that the man who has to read all the pornography in order to decide what's fit to be passed and what is fit not to be is the man most likely to become debauched. Did you hear any speaker uh, in the opposition to this motion, eloquent as one of them was, um, do, who, to whom you would delegate the task of deciding for you what you could read? Who to whom you would give the job of deciding for you, relieve you of the responsibility of hearing what you might have to hear? Do you know anyone? Hands up. Do you know anyone to whom you'd give this job? Does anyone have a nominee? You mean there's no one in Canada good enough to decide what I can read or hear? I had no idea. But there's a law that says there must be such a person, or there's a subsection of some piddling law that says it. Well, the hell with that law then. It's inviting you to be liars and hypocrites and to deny what you evidently know already. About the censorious instinct, we basically know all that we need to know. and We've known it for a long time. It comes from an old story about uh, another great Englishman, sorry to sound so uh, particular about that this evening, uh, uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson, the great lexicographer, author of the first compiler, I should say, of the first great dictionary of the English language. When it was complete, Dr. Johnson was waited upon by various delegations of people to congratulate him, of the nobility, of the quality, of the commons, of the lords, and also by a delegation of respectable ladies of London who attended on him in his Fleet Street lodgings and congratulated him. Dr. Johnson, they said, we are delighted to find that you have not included any indecent or obscene words in your dictionary. Ladies, said Dr. Johnson, I congratulate you on being able to look them up. <laughs> Anyone who can understand that joke, and I'm pleased to see that about 10% of you can. <laughs> Um, gets the point about censorship, especially prior restraint, as it's known in the United States, where it's banned by the First Amendment to the Constitution. It may not be determined in advance what words are apt or inapt. Uh, no one has the knowledge that would be required to make that call. And, more to the point, one has to suspect the motives of those who do so. In particular, the motives of those who are determined to be offended, of those who will go through a treasure house of English, like Dr. Johnson's first lexicon in search of filthy words to satisfy themselves and some instinct about which I dare not speculate. <laughs> now, I am uh, absolutely convinced that the main source of hatred in the world is religion and organized religion. Absolutely convinced of it. And I, I'm glad that you applaud, because it's a very great problem for those who oppose this motion, isn't it? How are they going to ban religion? How are they going to stop the expression of religious loathing, hatred, and bigotry? I speak as someone who's a fairly regular target of this, and not just in rhetorical form. I have been the target of many death threats. I know in, within a f short distance of where I'm currently living in Washington, I can name two or three uh, people whose names you'd probably know who can't go anywhere now without a security detail because of the criticisms they've made of one monotheism in particular. And this is in the capital city of the United States. So I know what I'm talking about, and I also have to, have to notice that the sort of people who ring me up and say they know where my children go to school, and they certainly know what my home number is and where I live, and what they're going to do to them and to my wife and to me, and who I have to take seriously because they have done it to people I know, uh, are just the people who are going to seek the protection of the hate speech law if I say what I think about their religion, which I'm now going to do. <laughs> because I don't, have any, um, I don't have any what you might call ethnic bias. I have no grudge of that sort. I can rub along with pre pretty much anyone of any 
as it were, origin or sexual orientation or language group, except people from Yorkshire, of course, um, <laughs> who are completely untakeable. Um, and I'm beginning to resent the confusion that's being imposed on us now, and there was some of it this evening, between uh, religious belief, uh, bl blasphemy, ethnicity, profanity, and what one might call multicultural etiquette. It's quite common now for people to use the expression, for example, anti-Islamic racism, as if an attack on a religion was an attack on an ethnic group. The word Islamophobia, in fact, is beginning to acquire the opprobrium of the, uh, that was once reserved for racial prejudice. This is a subtle and very nasty insinuation that needs to be met head on. Who said, what if Falwell says he hates fags? What if people act upon that? The Bible says you have to hate fags. If Falwell says he's saying it because the Bible says so, he's right. Yes, it might make people go out and use violence. What are you going to do about that? You're up against a group of people who will say, you don't you put your hands on our Bible or we'll call the hate speech police. Now, what are you going to do when you've dug that trap for yourself? Uh, somebody said that anti-Semitism and Kristallnacht in Germany was the result of 10 years of Jew baiting. 10 years? You must be joking. It's the result of 2,000 years of Christianity it, uh, based on one verse of one chapter of St. John's Gospel which led to a pogrom after every Easter sermon every year for hundreds of years because it claims that the Jews demanded the blood of Christ be on the heads of themselves and all their children to the remotest generation. That's the warrant and license for and incitement to anti-Jewish programs. What are you going to do about that? Where's your piddling subsection now? Does it say St. John's Gospel must be censored? Do I who've read Freud and know what the future of an illusion really is and know that religious belief is ineradicable as long as we remain a stupid, poorly evolved mammalian species, think that some Canadian law is going to solve this problem? Please. No, our problem is this, our prefrontal lobes are too small, and our adrenaline glands are too big, and our thumb-finger opposition isn't all that it might be, and we're afraid of the dark, and we're afraid to die, and we believe in the truths of holy books that are so stupid and so fabricated that a child can, and all children do, but as you can tell by their questions, actually see through them. And I think it should be, religion, treated with ridicule, and hatred and contempt, and I claim that right. Now, let's not dance around. Not all monotheisms are exactly the same at the moment. They're all based on the same illusion. They're all plagiarisms of each other. But there's one in particular that at the moment is posing a serious menace, not just to freedom of speech and freedom of expression, but to quite a lot of other freedoms too. And this is the religion that exhibits the horrible trio of self-hatred, self-righteousness and self-pity. I'm talking about militant Islam. Globally, it's a gigantic power. Globally, it's a gigantic power. It controls an enormous amount of oil wealth, several large countries and states uh, with, a, with an enormous fortune. It's pumping the ideology of Wahhabism and Salafism around the world, poisoning societies where it goes, ruining the minds of children, stultifying the young in its madrasas, training people in violence, uh, making a cult of death and suicide and murder. That's what it does globally. It's quite strong. In our societies, it poses as a cringing minority whose, whose faith you might offend, which deserves all the protection uh, that, that a small and vulnerable group might need. Now, it makes quite large claims for itself, doesn't it? It says it's the final revelation. It says that God spoke to one illiterate businessman in the Arabian Peninsula three times through an archangel and that the resulting material which as you can see when you read it is largely plagiarized from the Old and the New Testament almost all of it actually plagiarized ineptly from the Old and New Testament is to be accepted as a divine revelation and as the final and unalterable one and that those who do not accept this revelation are fit to be treated as cattle, infidels, potential chattel, slaves and Victims, when I tell you what, I don't think Muhammad ever heard those voices. I don't believe it. And the likelihood that I'm right, as opposed to the likelihood that a shepherd who couldn't, a businessman couldn't, who couldn't read, had bits of the Old and New Testament re-dictated to him by an archangel, I think puts me much more near the position of being objectively correct. 
but who is the one under threat? The person who promulgates this and says, I'd better listen because if I don't, I'm in danger, or me, who says, oh, no, I think this is so silly, you could even publish a cartoon about it. And up go the placards, and up go the yells, and the howls, and the screams. Behead those. This is in London. This is in Toronto. This is in New York. It's right in our midst now. Behead those. Behead those who cartoon Islam. Do they get arrested for hate speech? No. Might I get in trouble for saying what I've just said about the Prophet Muhammad? Yes, I might. Where are your priorities, ladies and gentlemen? You're giving away what's most precious in your own society, and you're giving it away without a fight, and you're even praising the people who want to deny you the right to resist it. Shame on you while you do this. Make the best use of the time you've got left. This is really serious. Now, if you look anywhere you like, because we've had invocations of a rather driveling and sickly kind tonight of our sympathy. What about the poor fags? What about the poor Jews, the wretched women who can't take the abuse, and the slaves and their descendants, and the, and the tribes who didn't make it and were told that their land was forfeit? Look anywhere you like for the warrant for slavery, for the subjection of women as chattel, for the burning and, and, and uh, flogging of homosexuals, for ethnic cleansing, for anti-Semitism, for all of this, you look no further than a famous book that's on every pulpit in this city and in every synagogue and in every mosque. And then just see whether you can square the fact that the force that is the main source of hatred is also the main caller for censorship. And when you realize that you're therefore this evening faced with a gigantic false antithesis, I hope that still won't stop you from giving the motion before you the resounding endorsement that it deserves. Thanks awfully. Night night. <laughs> Stay cool. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.